Welcome to Advocacy, Advocacy from the Ground Up, the second session in our case studies and leadership series. This series is meant to be an opportunity to learn from leaders of the past. We'll listen to a short presentation, and in this case, three short presentations, <laughs> and then discuss the lessons we see in these stories <clears throat> and the implications on our work today in museums. These sessions are very much come as you are, uh, participate as you are comfortable type of sessions. Um, please feel free to use the chat or raise your hand to ask questions um, via video or audio. Um, and comment, you know, comment, chatter, whatever you would like to do. Uh, this is a conversation today. We have pre presenters and presentations, but we're happy to um, address questions along the way. Um, I already mentioned that the session is being recorded. We will share a link later. Our presenters today are Mary Gervitz, an archivist at the Indiana Historical Society, Susan Hall Dotson, coordinator of African American history at the Indiana Historical Society, and Nicole Martinez Legrand, coordinator of multicultural collections at the Indiana Historical Society. I'll let you, I'll let them tell you a little bit more about themselves and the museum when they present in a few moments. Before we begin the presentation, though, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that while we are gathered today virtually, each of us joins from the unceded land of indigenous peoples. During events like this that are virtual, digital spaces may substitute our physical sense of place. It is important to redirect our attention to the land we each occupy in this moment and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. The office of AMM is in Indianapolis, actually at the Indiana Historical Society, the homeland of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, Shawnee, We, and Kickapoo communities. I invite you to join me in acknowledging these and all other Midwestern indigenous communities, their elders, both, both past and present, as well as future generations. AMM recognizes that our organization and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society, which caused the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples throughout the Midwest and beyond. Thank you for helping us challenge these practices by disrupting and dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. And with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to uh, our friends at the Indiana Historical Society. And I think, Mary, you're up first. Thank you so much. Um, we're coming to you today like uh, from the Indiana Historical Society. We are located in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, right on the canal downtown. Um, in addition to having a library an archive, um, an extensive collection of documents, photographs, maps, books, um, all relating to the history of Indiana and the old Northwest Territory. Um, we also are a museum space. We have um, three exhibits on right now, um, Madam Walker, uh, Jeanette Records, and um, a bicentennial celebration of the city of Indianapolis, as well as an exhibit on Title IX, and of course, Destination Indiana, um, which is where you can explore different stories from Indiana's past uh, virtu virtually. And so with that, I'd like to tell you about um, an amazing Hoosier. Uh, her name is Mary Byrne. Um, Mary was born in Rushville, Indiana in 1951. She was one of five kids and um, she ended up attending Eastern Illinois University where she studied psychology. Um, and she ended up coming back to Indianapolis, taking a job with an organization called Stopover, um, which served homeless youth. Um, and when she came back to Indianapolis, she um, started exploring her identity as um, a feminist and as a, as a lesbian. And um, she started attending a gathering called Lavender Hill, um, which was sort of a pitch-in event for like-minded women, um, as well as becoming involved with um, the Local Now organization. And also at that time in the late 70s, um, women with now and, and other women were organizing for the ERA. 
ratification. Um, and through these meetings, um, she sort of realized that there wasn't really any place for women like her to go. Um, there was like a, she mentioned in an oral history that we have with her, that there was like a grungy bar on South Street in Indianapolis. With, and that was the only place where, where women could gather outside of, you know, now meetings or going to this Lavender Hill kitchen. And she also was really interested in music and especially women's music. Um, and so she also really desired to um, create a place that was welcoming to women that could encourage women to get involved with performing arts. And then um, also a place this evolved to a place where um, where women could um, discover political consciousness for women's rights and gay rights and, and things like that. So she ended up quitting her job um, as a social worker with Stopover. And she started working at the Waffle House so she could learn sort of the restaurant business. Um, and then later went to, like after a year, she went to bartending school and she started attending bar. Um, so she could sort of build those skills. And then she decided to purchase the Locker B pub um, and turn it into a bar called the Labyrinth. And you can see this photo here. Um, this is her on the ladder in, in front um, and other women sort of painting this dingy kind of gross space um, in order to turn it into a, you know, a cozy, and cool environment that, that women and, and their male guests um, would want to attend. Uh, next slide, please, Nicole. Um, these are some exterior photos um, of the Labyrinth, um, which was in operation from 1979 to 1984. Um, what I think is really interesting about the Labyrinth, um, so they had a few snafus with opening. Um, she wanted this to be a space specifically for women. And so there was sort of a membership element to this where women could become members and any men who would come had to be accompanied by, by a woman. Um, so she wanted women to feel safe here. And on opening night of the bar, um, she found that all of the tires in the parking lot had been slashed. Um, because people were not happy of this changeover from, from a sort of male dominated space to a, a woman dominated space. Um, but they sort of took it in stride and they all went out and uh, changed their tires and ended up having a party that night um, in the Lavras. And then she never really had um, issues after that. Um, so next slide, please. Another great element, I think, it's really unique about the Labyrinth. Um, also, the Labyrinth in general is a, is a symbol of, of the matriarchy. So that's why she, she chose that as the name of her bar. Um, she sent out a letter um, and a calendar to everyone that was on her mailing list. So when you come into the bar, you would ask if you wanted to sign up to be a member. Um, and you would ask if you want to subscribe to this membership list. And so every month she wrote a letter to all of her members and supporters. Um, she started out with about 150 on her mailing list and she ended up with over 1200 um, recipients of her letter over the course of, of the time she was operating the bar. And so you can sort of follow the progress of um, this space for the community as, as it went on. Um, and it was initially you know, just a place to, to dance and drink and unwind after work. But as the community builds and as she, I think she's also developing her political and social consciousness at that time as well. And so you can see through her letters to members um, over the course of time, she's hosting a letter writing party. Um, so folks can write to their Congress people to support women's rights and gay rights. Um, they are hosting events for now. Um, they are um, arranging for people to go to the ERA march in Chicago. 
um, they are discussing racism and classism within the lesbian community. Um, they, she is making a plea to support women in sports and things like that. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so here, this is sort of, as she went on also the, the lab notes sort of got more, more professionalized. Um, you can see there and as she, she you know, she built her, her respondent list. Um, she ended up getting out of the bar business in 1984. Um, because I, I not necessarily because the Labyrinth was not a successful place. But it was difficult for her because of all the hours and also because she felt it difficult morally that in order to make money, you sort of had to encourage people to be drinking more than they should. And she didn't really, she couldn't really rectify that, you know, with, with, with her, her moral conscious, consciousness. So she got out of the bar business. Um, and next slide, please. Um, and so in that interim time, she worked for a while as um, an editor for a women's publication called I Know You Know. Um, she became a real estate agent. And also she spent quite a few years working for the National Women's Music Festival. Um, that was a big part of the Labyrinth as well, was bringing in women's music, um, hosting open mic nights, um, just so women could have a safe safe space to explore um, that part of themselves and maybe things that they hadn't had the confidence to do elsewhere, they felt safe doing at the Labyrinth. Um, and during this time with the music festival, she met her future wife, Tamara Tracy. Um, and Tamara was part owner of a bookstore called Outward Bound. And you can see that um, here, is some of the swag from this bookstore. Um, which was an LGBTQ plus bookstore um, on East Street in the Mass Ave area of Indianapolis. Um, and eventually Mary came over to Outward Bound and served as manager. Um, and this also was sort of a place for the community. They brought in writers, they brought in musicians, um, again, like another safe and welcoming space for, for people in their community. Um, and next slide, please. So um, throughout all this time, Mary's political consciousness was definitely, definitely growing and she sort of became a, a spokesperson. Um, she shows up in the newspaper a lot for um, promotion of equal rights for um, LGBTQ community. Um, you can see her here speaking on um, a bill in the in the state house. She was also a part of um, the Greater Indianapolis Fairness Alliance, um, which was sort of like an, an early organization that that fed into Indiana equality um, later on. And Mary ended her career um, as the executive director of the Indiana Youth Group, um, which is an organization still in existence here in Indiana that serves LGBTQ plus youth. Um, so I really think that Mary um, always found a way to follow her interests and passions and turn them into jobs and also to turn them into um, a space to create community and also to court community buy-in. Um, she was always made it a community effort, especially at the bar at Labra. She would have days where she would invite her customers to come in and help do a spring clean at the bar and then like offer free drinks afterwards or things like that. Um, and I also think that her experience at Labras really set her up for future endeavors because she learned about a lot about people, about um, management and leadership um, and, and, and things like that. And I think that helped, she definitely brought those skills when she was managing bookstore, Outward Bound, 
And also, most definitely when she was with the Indianapolis Fair Fairness Alliance and especially um, the Indiana Youth Group. Um, next slide, please. These are just a few um, quotes that I pulled. Uh, one is from Lab Notes, the newsletter from Labrys. Um, she says, when push comes to shove, I can do anything that I want to. It's a matter of what one puts in their head and their heart. Um, and then another we have from an oral history that she gave with her wife um, when she says she's always jumping to the fire and she doesn't know why she does that. Um, but, you know, she was always looking for a, a place to create community, a place to create connections and, and create spaces and create a city, um, you know, and a state that was a more fair and welcoming place to, to women and to um, LGBTQ plus um, individuals. And with that, I'll turn over to Nicole. Hi, <clears throat> I am Nicole Martinez Legrand. I am the Multicultural Collections Coordinator here at the Indiana Historical Society. I began with the Historical Society in 2016 when um, the institution itself made a firm commitment to tell everyone's story, uh, being a part of Indiana Storyteller. And so I initially was hired to help fill in the historical gap um, of our two of our largest populations in the state, Asian and Latino. And so um, I'm presenting to, you, presenting to you some research and some uh, and a profile of uh, one of the 50 people that I interviewed talking about <clears throat> leadership not only within their community and throughout the state. So this is uh, Maria Carmen Velasquez. Um, so her interview was done posthumously. She passed away in 1985. Um, so a lot of this research is based on um, her children and, and research about the organizations that she was involved in. Um, she was, um, and here's a photo of her uh, in Marion uh, in Grant County in Indiana, uh, I think 19, uh, I think late 1960s, early uh, 1970s. So who was Carmen? So Carmen was born in uh, Parsons, Kansas. Um, and so, and then she made her, and she grew up in Chicago, Illinois. In terms of the Mexican diaspora into the Midwest, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, stopping off somewhere in Kansas or St. Louis and making their way to Chicago is not uncommon uh, in regards to many of the industries, most notably the railroad. Um, so she grew up in a, um, a, an early community that was in Chicago and she was affected by polio. So she spent most of her adolescence uh, in convalescent homes, notably Catholic co uh, convalescent homes. So seeing the nuns take care of um, her and other people afflicted by um, this horrible um, epidemic. Um, so this really, her family, her children really talk about how this was such a transformative experience for her. And this really truly, truly planted the seeds for um, social work. So um, while she was in Chicago, she met, uh, met Albert Velasquez, who was also from that area, but had uh, his family had moved to Fairmount uh, in Grant County, Indiana. So uh, right over here, this is, um, this is Albert and his father Cipriano and his mother Maria. And here they are in the 1940s. And here is Maria shortly after she joined the family. So, and, uh, and here are the Velasquez children working on their farm that they owned um, in Grant County. So Fairmount, Grant County um, in the 1940s, 1930s was not um, uh, heavily populated by Latin American um, individuals. Um, this is Grant County as well as Marion, Indiana at this time were, um, especially Marion, were known as sundown towns and probably the site of one of the most infamous lynchings in the 1930s. So, you know, not only was Carmen a groundbreaking person, so was this family moving into and planting roots um, and planting crops in Fairmount, Indiana and Grant County. Albert would later serve in uh, World War II and would be a POW uh, in Germany, but uh, he did survive and, and did come back. 
So he and Carmen would go on to have 10 children. So while raising this wonderful large brood of children, Carmen would literally walk out into the fields of Grant County and asking migrant farm workers of their, you know, spiritual and their material needs. So, you know, reflecting on Albert's family and, you know, the, you know, the work that takes into maintaining a farm, um, you know, she kind of became a one woman St. Vincent de Paul. So farm workers, migrant and seasonal farm workers in the United States, being of Latin American or Mexican, mostly Mexican origin, was not something uncommon. And in terms of um, advocacy and outreach, it, w it leaned more to charity, right? And so, you know, as she's walking out into these fields and and seeing what's happening on nationally with, you know, Cesar Chavez and the Chicano Civil Rights Movement and, and seeing what's happening to, you know, this transient community that, that's here and the community that's growing in Marion, um, she felt really the need and the call to serve. So um, in the 1970s, President Johnson uh, released federal funds basically on a program called the, the War on Poverty. Poverty, and because of that, in 19, um, uh, 1965, um, the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, Gary, South Bend, Fort Wayne, formed an incorporated an organization called AMIS, Associated Migrant Opportunity Services Inc. Uh, so this would be set up the framework for um, not only just uh, charity, but for advocacy, working with the health department, looking at uh, farm labor camps, trying to work with um, farmers in the area to help provide, you know, basic necessities like childcare, um, education, making sure that, you know, children are, you know, stopping that learning loss. And Carmen was um, head of the sub east office in Marion, Indiana, really at the forefront of of this work and, uh, you know, and also being a woman. So uh, it was ran by, uh, here in Indianapolis headquartered, who kind of managed the organization by a man of Tulio Goldner, um, a man of Mexican descent from Mexico City. He was also well known here for helping start um, different organizations in Indianapolis, most notably the Hispanic Center. Um, so she really had, um, you know, she was this, this woman from a country, a woman without a college education, um, really working and taking the reins of of, of advocacy and farm work. So uh, out of all the different offices across the state, the Marion County area office, the sub east office uh, caused a lot of, um, ruffled a lot of feathers and were in the news a lot. So, um, so they in the early 70s did a 66 mile march from Marion to Indianapolis on Easter weekend. And so there were about 37 marchers. So they would, you know, would walk all day, stop at a certain point, have somebody pick them up and then start again. And so they were walking from Grant County down to Marion County in some um, areas that, that wouldn't really widely uh, accept them. <clears throat> and so, um, so they would uh, walk to uh, wanting to meet with the governor and the board state of health to um, to get you know better policies to put in place to help protect the workers and the families that came. So it wasn't just so you had a mix of people who were living in these migrant camps, men and women, and then sometimes they'd just bring along their mother-in-laws, um, you know, and their children and cousins. So it wasn't like you know they they came home for work. This was more a, a family act family activity, and you know following the growing season. Um, and then also, I think a big part of Carmen's story is that a large part of her, you know, with, with success also comes, um, becomes failure. And so Carmen was actually fired in retaliation for, um, you know, for basically pushing the envelope in a lot of different ways. And so um, she was later, and part of this walk was um, highlight, you know, um, in, you um, recognition of that, helping to have her get reinstated. And so she was, and she retired in the early 1980s. Um, she, because of all her work, she also maintained the support of the local, local Catholic church and had a charity center there as well. So she continued her work well on into um, older age um, and she would uh, pass away shortly after uh, she retired, I think, in 1985. So um, this is the story of Carmen Velasquez. And just to show how her legacy 
um, the seeds of her labor had expanded here in Indianapolis. Her grandson, Zach Adamson, is the vice president of our city county council, really working hard to um, maintain her legacy and, uh, and uplift uh, those who, um, I guess, I guess the less fortunate or, or underrepresented. Thank you. And next up is my colleague, Susan Hall Dalton. Good morning, good morning. I am Susan Hall Dotson, the coordinator of African American history here at the Indiana Historical Society. And I'm approaching my third year anniversary here in Indiana, in Indianapolis. So the scholarship, the history, most of it is, is rather new. So it's been a, a learning curve and it demonstrates to me that we live in in our silos, particularly as it's regarding history. We have big national and international figures, but as you go from place to place and city to city and county to county, um, those names don't always resonate outside of their locales. So today I'm going to talk about the measure of what is leadership? What does that look like? Um, and as we've seen from Mary and Nicole, it's varied, it's, it's diverse. So here we have Harriet Vesta Bailey Kahn and all the items that you'll see come from her collection that was given by her son. Next slide. And here goes a picture of, at this point, Mrs. Harriet Kahn. She was born in 1922. So this is gonna kind of shift our, our narrative a little bit to an earlier period where we often think of particularly African-Americans as um, not being as educated, not being in the middle to the upper middle class. And, but we'll see that it's not so. Here she is, she was born in 1922, right here in Indianapolis. Um, had I been alive during her, her life, she and I would have been acquainted. She attended um, Indianapolis schools. She graduated from Christmas Attics High School. Um, she also went to Bethel AME Church um, of which we have those collections. So what we'll see in this talk about her is the two to six degrees of separation, if you will. Um, and it's not always what we think. Her father, she followed in his footsteps. She went to college. She went to Talladega College at HBCU in Alabama and her father also attended there. So she was following in his footsteps. So she came back, she got married early in 1941, right after graduation to Clifton Kahn. What we see in her leadership story is that, um, you can be married and you can be a mother. How she did it all is beyond me. She had seven children. Next slide. She graduated from high school, as I said, in 37. She went on to college, graduated. She was only 14 when she went to um, college in 1941. And she graduated from law school in 1955 at Indiana University's Law right here at IUPUI. Um, she started her career just like her father, politically as a deputy attorney general. Her father, at a time when there were no blacks elected officials in Indiana, between 1896 to 1932, and his position was an appointed position, not elected. But here she's running for in 1966, as a Republican, because at that time, most African-Americans were aligned with the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln. Until such time, things started to shift with the Dixiecrats and some others, and that's a whole other history lesson. But as you can see in here is Ray Crow as well from Christmas Addicts fame, um, running for office. So she, she was elected as state rep, but look at the, the makeup of that picture. 
to women, to African Americans, all men, all white men right here in Indianapolis. Next, from Marion County. So in the 1969 session, her rise to leadership again is on an island. There's looks like mostly men in there to me. Um, and that's okay. It just goes to show that the struggle has been real. It's continual, it's perpetual. Um, and she did that as we think about that era, 69, barefoot and pregnant. She was barefoot and pregnant a lot. She had seven kids, but it didn't stop her from going out into the workforce. It did not stop her from reaching higher and highest heights as an elected official um, in a city, in a county that even today is only 32, 30%, 28% African American. So her election was not just based on getting the black vote. Next slide. But I'm sure at some point it was a lonely life to be in spaces and places um, where she led alone, but she was busy. As I read her obituary, which you can find in the collection guide, as well as in the boxes. Most of this is not, none of this I think is digitized, two items at this point. So you have to come down and visit us and take a look. But the collection guides um, scope as well as bio sketch are pretty rich. Next. And she was busy even into 1970, she was at Northwestern University as I, looked at this photograph yet again. And it was just a short course for defense lawyers. There are 10 women out of 178 people. There are approximately eight, it's hard to tell on this, um, but eight African-Americans and even harder to see if there are any other people of color. Um, yet again, she's rising to higher heights and holding her ground arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, even if not in unity with her male counterparts later in her career, um, professional development. Next slide. But what does that mean? What is the measure of success? So she had all these great positions, started her own law firm, was attorney general, um, Deputy Attorney General. But here goes a piece that I found rather interesting and it's from the governor. And it says, best wishes to Harriet Bailey Kahn, a true leader in our community. Speaks volumes. Who's, who's judging you? And do you need others affirmation to be considered a leader? But here we have it um, from one of her I guess you could say her boss and a colleague and fellow um, politician from the mayor's office, not the governor's office. Next slide. But upon her death, this letter went to her daughter and it's from then, what? From the White House, from President Ronald Reagan. Um, and talking about her being a devoted and active citizen and her years of service in the Republican party will be remembered and appreciated by many. And he offers his condolence to her daughter and family. So what is the measure of leadership? What is the measure of success? Next slide. Here is a poster. I also found one for those of you from Indianapolis, a burger chef menu, a placemat rather, that had pictures that you could color that included her as well. But this poster of black history in Indianapolis, as you see next to the dash, the important part of our, our story, it doesn't have an end date. So she is still living and is seen and being recognized for her work, and her service in the community, along with many other notable African-Americans, Wes Montgomery, Matthias Nolcox, um, who was the first principal of Crispus Attucks High School. 
Robert Lee Brokenberg, the first elected official to the state legislature here in Indiana of African-American descent. Next. Now this little piece of paper, I found it really intriguing to me and it's just a little scrap of a newspaper article. And it was about a club she belonged to, the Happy Gardeners. So in addition to being a celebrated attorney and as well as being a public official, she belonged to the middle class, upper middle class, and she belonged to many women's clubs and other civic engagements. So how she found the time to lead in that way and raise her children um, is, is sometimes hard to fathom. But here, it's interesting, if we bring it into 2021, they were having it at her house and business was as usual uh, with the president, and she was the president, and a lively discussion followed a recent evening with Cicely Tyson attended by the gardeners. So there was an event where she was here. So then here, one leaders with other leaders and other prominent individuals. Um, but she did find time for fun, for games. It says they play games, were played, and the hostess served refreshments. So she was a lady who lunches and as well as a working mom and politician. Next slide. And to just give testament to all that she did in her levels of leadership, these are, there are so many more, just copies of her membership cards of which she and I share one membership in particular, um, two actually together. She is a life member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She joined in college. She went on to then graduate and come back to Indianapolis and join what was the Chai chapter, which then morphed into what is now known as um, Indianapolis alumni chapter, of which I am now a member since I moved here. And she was at one time the president. It's a lot of work. So in addition to being a leader for the, um, the greater community, she was doing it for smaller communities. Um, the Bar Association, she was a den mother for the Cub Scouts. Um, and it goes on and on. A life member and former president of the local branch of the NAACP. And last but not least on the upper left is a radio announcement for, this shows the two degrees of separation of leadership, collections, the, um, Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta hosted an event. It was at um, Short Ridge High School in 1957, and it was a piano concert. And the performer was, as it says there, former child prodigy, now mature artist, Philippa Duke Schuyler, who sadly perished in Vietnam in a, a crash, but she was a prodigy. Her father was a writer. Her mother had interesting ways of raising her. And we just recently acquired a collection that has numerous items and personal letters between a gentleman and Miss Schuyler. Um, so we take the local to the international. Her story is pretty international. Just from this one, one little piece of paper, which was a PSA. So what is the measure of a leader? It's all of these. It's, and so much more that you're not just um, singular in nature, that your life is fuller and can expand beyond just public office, if you will. Thanks. That was great. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. I just love seeing all the pieces from your archives. Is it is it just a ton of fun to go through and, and pull those materials out? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's like treasure hunting. <laughs> I love a good scavenger hunt. Oh, uh, I can. Because yeah, you never know what you'll find. <laughs> you never know what you find beyond what you were looking for that tells some other story 
or connects you to some other place, space, or organization, like those two little pieces. I was like, wow, imagine that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I personally love that there were at least a couple of those stories were women with big families that they were raising. And I think we're often, and I, I, I think most of our participants today and, and all of us are women here, you know, might be able to sort of attest to this feeling like there's this pressure that you have to choose, right? To be a mom mm -hmm. or to pursue your passions or um, to become a leader. And, and I hear it a lot from young people today, young, young women who are like, I don't know what I should do first. <laughs> like well you know you don't have to choose it's there are ways so it's it's always inspiring for me to hear the stories of women who are who have and are making a difference um while also you know raising their families so very cool. I think sometimes that forces you to be better in different in different ways you know there you feel like you're being pulled in different directions and you're neglecting one while focusing on the other or you know both, both or other, but, um, but I don't know, in some ways I feel like it, it pushes you even harder to, to be, um, I don't know, just to be better. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I know, I know what you're talking about though. I, I do. Mm -hmm. I think you, uh, your sense of priorities may be just uh, come a little bit more naturally, but also like your ability to kind of balance time and all these things you have in motion because <laughs> kids are constantly moving, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Ra Rachel posted in the chat that she feels like all these ladies make her feel lazy, but don't feel that way, Rachel, <laughs> by any no. means. I think uh, everybody's balancing a lot in their lives. We just, it's, you know, having kids Whether you're not a measure. Fur, fur mom, aunt, uh, or anything, you know, those are, you know, I think it's just, you know, how you have to, how you uh, align your priorities, you know, focus on your priorities, because I think all of us are focusing on, on a wide variety of different things and balancing things with our, you know, first personal and professional lives. So um, being a parent or not being a parent, you know, I think those are all kind of the same um, guiding points to our driving us towards our own success. Right. In volunteering, I think, you know, yeah. all of you had examples of the volunteer work these women did too. And I think, I, I know a lot of people who balance a lot of volunteer time with their kids' schools or they mm -hmm. volunteer mm -hmm. in their communities, you know, they're, maybe they're like the organizer of all the events in their neighborhood, <laughs> you know, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't, every, everyone has a different sort of shape to their lives in that, in that sense, trying to be a leader. So. I would interject that that's what the dash is. You know, what do you do in that time that you have? She died in 1981. Um, she did not live to be 100. And she crammed in a lot of things into that time. And also during difficult times in our, in our history. She was born during Jim Crow. She persevered and became elected during within the moment of the civil rights era. Um, and, and she lived in a state that wasn't as welcoming, obviously to women, as you see that picture, they were just like, where are we? Where, what are we doing? And in one image, it looks like, it may have been like the, the clerk of the, I have, I, I'm not sure, but it didn't appear that she was actually an elected official sitting at the front as the clerk of the state legislature. And I was like, wow. Um, but it's our choices, what we do, what we can do in spite of, and some have more advantages. She was a second generation college graduate in 1941, um, as opposed to some others. And she was living, she worked hard. She earned I, her pension and some other stuff had a will, these are all in her collection. And some of the fact that she was a member and had all these cards to different, the Firemen's Association and something else, most of them come with a check. You have to write a check. Um, so you get sweat equity, but she was also a member, to be a life member of the NAACP, you have to write a check. To be a life member of Delta Sigma Theta, you have to write a check. Um, 
And so she was putting her money, her talent, her time, and her treasure. Um, but the irony is she was married in 1941 and divorced by 1960. At a time when a lot of women didn't do that either. That was not a popular thing to do. I don't know much about him. I haven't found out. And I guess it doesn't matter, but he gone. She still kept it moving. She kept working. She kept persevering. But I see her relationship as you go through some of these collections, you can dig a little deeper maybe if they're there, if the items are there, we're only as good as what people give us. But there are letters to her mother. There are letters about sending checks when she was in college. Um, so we did get, I won't say a cradle to the grave kind of story. There seems to be some missing pieces, but we do get a good sense of her trying to just live her life and find some balance and do the things that were good for her. And there may be people in her life who said that maybe she wasn't there enough for them. Um, yeah. And what else? So. I was thinking, you know, looking at all these different women from different cultural backgrounds, different um, socioeconomic backgrounds, I think the thing that how we can compare to this to museum leadership is resources. You know, these women had, you know, thinking about the time in which they were born and times of which they became a leader um, and how they had to, you know, create these resources for themselves to better serve the community, right? And I think that's what we do as museums. You know, we have to create these resources because, you know, in the last couple of years, you know, we're seen as like official, you know, tr a trusted, um, you know, trusted sources of information. You know, people are, you know, in 2020 with these societal and cultural awakenings, people are looking to us more to to tell these stories, right? And so I think, you know, looking at their leadership and, and you know, where they're coming from, you know, it's, it's all, I think it's about resources. I like that. I was thinking about community too. There's this, mm -hmm. you know, in, in some ways, even Susan, the examples you were giving with Harriet of the organizations she became a part of, I have no doubt that the people in those communities, those organizations were a part of her resource list, right? Her network to help her. And, and Mary, <laughs> Mary Byrne, she built her community, right? She was like, she created spaces for them to connect and then, um, and then kind of moved them to action, right? It was the mm -hmm. process for, of them learning together and then making a difference together. Uh, and I definitely see how museums fit into that. I like how she worked at Waffle House to kind of figure out, like, <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is where I'm going to get my training, because we're always looking for different areas for training, right? And so Charity and I know each other from, you know, I've worked at different museums. I've worked for art museums, children museums. I never in a million years would think that I would flourish in a history museum, um, you know, or, or historical society and archive. And so, um, you know, I offer a different, different perspectives on, and as well as my other colleagues here, on um, you know museums, and I, I know it always has to come to like resources, therefore the abundance or lack of. So uh, that's why I admire all of these women and their different perspectives and how they, you know, really carved out these spaces for not only just themselves but for um, the communities that they wanted to serve. Um, I wondered if anybody who's here with us today has questions. Uh, I I see Elizabeth from Illinois State Museum is on. <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, I know some of your organizations are doing work to try to uh, build awareness and mm -hmm. sort of move people in your communities to action. Um, and Elizabeth, I was specifically thinking when I saw you on here um, about the series that you all are hosting, uh, the virtual series kind of conversations around um, DEAI topics in the work you're doing at the State Museum. But, I think those are all examples of what museums are doing out there, like these women that have been featured today. Um, Mary, a question for you. You know, again, I'm just fascinated with digging into the archive. I, I do feel like it's sort of a treasure hunt. Um, is it fairly common to find stories about women in the LGBTQ plus sort of you know, histories at the Historical Society in the archive? I would say, so um, we started the LGBTQ plus collecting initiative, um, I believe in, 
2014, maybe? Can't, I can't remember. It's been a while. Um, and we, most of our stories are from um, white men, gay white men. Um, we do have a few instances, like Mary and um, her wife, Tamara. We also have an oral history and a collection from um, the women who owned um, Dreams and Swords, which was um, the LGBTQ bookstore in Indianapolis um, before Outward Bound. Um, so we have their oral history. We have their collection from Dreams and Swords. Um, and we have, um, you know, documentation of women through, through um, larger LGBTQ collections. Um, but I would say that it's something we definitely need to work on and have a more um, diverse sample um, of, of, the, of the community because it is a diverse community. And I feel like I've heard a, a couple other museums in the region talking about trying to collect more uh, of those stories right now. I know Missouri Historical Society is doing that kind of work and some others. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, if more and more stories begin to emerge from the, those efforts. Um, any other questions from our, oh, Elizabeth? Good question. Yeah, I was wondering, so something that I've been thinking about as I've read, uh, several biographies recently and other things is like, what are the support systems? Like, do you see the evidence of those in these people's, in these women's lives of um, just as, um, I feel like that's often been the women, like prominent men, women are often the support system that allow them to come to prominence <laughs> um, because they're, they're keeping the home in order, they're doing whatever. And so I, I feel like those are some of those hidden stories um, are those support systems that allow people to, because you can't do it, you can't really do it all. So what are the support systems in your lives that um, allow for that? Um, and I think as someone who tends towards being an introvert and I'd rather just work in the background, I'm really fascinated by those stories too, of like what allow these people who seem to have these, they do have amazing lives and they do do amazing things. You know, what are the evidences even in archives of those support systems in their lives that allow them, you know, help them to get to that place and give them the support they need at home or at work or, or those places for that. I think um, in Carmen's instance, you know, her husband was a POW uh, during World War II. He was in the newspaper a lot. His family was well known. And, um, you know, I think her just doing her own thing. And I also think her 10 children were a source of support as well, because a lot of them did work alongside uh, with her. But she did get she did um, get the support and the notice of the local Catholic church. Um, and other women that I've also interviewed, I think, uh, especially, you know, I'm dealing with ethnic communities, and a lot of them talk about, like, their family being their first sense of support to, to give them that, um, you know, whether they came from, like, socioeconomic, you know, or affluent families or, or not, you know, family was always kind of, and their culture, so their culture helped drive their contributions to um, the community, to Indiana, to things that we all benefit from. I think in the case um, of, of Mary, um, when she was running the, the Lavras, she, I don't really know, there's not much documentation of a support system aside from, I think, people who also were really investing in, in the space and who became friends as she operated the bar. Um, I think later on, if, when she met her wife, um, they were definitely like, Part, they were full partners in the bookstore and definitely, you know, supportive of each other's um, professional in, endeavors um, um, once they met and, and, and had that relationship. And I think as well, the um, women who owned Dreams and Swords, um, that was also, you know, like just spousal support there too. In the collection for Harriet, um, box number three is filled with articles, stories, art, letters from her children. Um, and I don't know what the spacing is on them. 
So at some point it suggests, even like in the will, which ones she left what to later in life, who was the executor, which was the oldest, the one who received that letter from um, President Reagan. So there seemed to be a pecking order on who could do what. There are some letters that are rather personal about who didn't do what they're supposed to do. And, and this is in their adult life. Like, if you don't do this, you maybe you need to move out over there and not rent, say, I think it was the grandmother, the late grandmother's house. Um, so her mother was still there for quite some time. Don't know about her dad. Um, and some of these organizations that she belonged to have that kind of, and I belong to similar ones, including actually being in Delta, this built-in support structure, whether it's um, just psychologically, where you can bond with like women who are doing like things, um, who not all are working, because everybody, especially even now, are not working um, moms or working women. Some are stay-at-home moms that I am in this organization with. And we do not all aspire to be the president of the organization. I have finally realized that I am better suited in that one as I could be a committee chair or something like that, but I do not aspire to elected office on local, regional or national level. And I will eat my head if I change my mind. But in the meantime, I like being rank and file. There's something to be said for that. Um, but, you know, right now the, that chapter has over 400 women. So there you get friends and connections. She belonged to church. She went to first Bethel AME, then later to a Unitarian church. So she had her, her kids were in the Cub Scouts. That's more work, but that's also creates another um, support environment of people doing like things, even her Republican party affiliations where she either wrote checks or she actually went and participated to give you some of those extra things that you may need in your life. Now, whether she had a housekeeper and babysitters at, at some point, that may come out. I haven't dug in every single minutia box of hers, but we look at like Madam CJ Walker, she had a cook. I mean, she was traveling all over the country and all over, in other parts of the world. She had a cook who we have represented in the UR there, um, somebody to help take care of her, as well as the boarders who lived in her house on West Street. So, so now we got DoorDash and some of us who, or some of them who have more resources have private chefs. That's a good question. I feel like it's also a reminder that it's a privilege to have a support network. Not everybody has that. So, and I, in related to museum work, I think that we've all found um, that mentors and support net networks are kind of necessary to, to advance um, and to make a career in this industry too, so. Well, um, we're at time. I don't wanna uh, keep us any longer. This, was, this has been a great conversation. Again, wonderful presentations today, uh, Susan, Mary, and Nicole. Great to have you. And of course, I'm sure I'll see you around the office at some point when I'm in there again. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for being here. Thanks to everybody who came to listen in today. And we'll be sharing a link later as well uh, when this is online and available to, to share, so. Thanks so much and have a great weekend, everybody.